Well, I'm joined now by David Willits, the Minister of State for Universities and Science, and also author of the book The Pinch, How the Baby Boomers Took Their Children's Future and Why They Should Give It Back. Next to him, Zoe Williams, journalist and columnist for The Guardian and New Statesman. Well, David Willits, you saw in Siobhan's piece there the problem. What does your government do about it? Well, what we've got to do is try to make it easier, once again, for people to build up the two crucial assets, owning your own home and having a funded pension. That's why we've got to get house building going again and make it easier for young people to get started on the housing ladder. And we've also got to make it easier to save your pension, which is what our auto-enrollment proposals are all about. But you're not building enough houses, are you, to make No, we, st we certainly, we still need to build more and we've got to make access to housing finance easier. And we've also got to get the, the pension saving going again, because in many ways what this fascinating report is picking up is the end of the defined benefit pension of the old form. These are the people who are no longer going to have that type of pension income. We've got to create new ways of funded pension saving, and that's what we're doing. So, Williams? Um, I'm quite sceptical. I mean, obviously, I agree with the house building programme, and I agree that we do need a massive amount more houses. There is a problem here, though, isn't there? Which is that for kids now working, there's no way in hell they can afford a house at market rates. So you're either hoping for a massive crash in the housing market, and I mean massive, you know, everything reduced by two thirds, or you're hoping for a massive boost in wages, which I don't think is happening anytime soon, or you're hoping for some kind of massive systemic taxation change like land value tax. Now, I think, I don't think any of the political class is taking this seriously. You've got two things going on. You've got the fact that an entire generation has no hope of getting onto the housing ladder. And you also have the fact that, you know, with the end of final salary pensions, nobody has a hope of retiring in comfort either. So you've got to take them on as mass projects. You can't take them on as kind of piecemeal, let's build a few more houses. That's not going to work. OK, but this report looks at people in their late 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. And it makes a point that the likes of you and I uh, have spent a lot of money in early adulthood, didn't save enough, so we kind of, any penury that we have in the future, we've got to take some responsibility for it. There is a huge tendency on the part of politicians, which I'm sure you'll agree with, to put this down to individuals and our individual habits. Now, sure, we didn't have the kind of frugal mindset of our parents, that's certainly true, but we didn't have many of their advantages either, and we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the job for life, well, we didn't yeah. have the kind of... Yeah, yeah the biggest, um, I accept there are very powerful structural forces work, and by, the, by far the most significant was the arrival of hundreds of millions of workers from China and, Japan, and India and elsewhere in the jobs market, so that the performance of wages in the West, is suddenly people working in bell foundries in London have competitors around the world in the way that there were not when my generation emptied the workforce. But I, where I disagree with Zoe is that I think that when you look at what we're doing to, ease, to help bridge the gap between the deposit and the amount of mortgage you can take and the cost of a house, there are some initiatives that are available to many young people that okay, will help them on the housing market. But you're perpetuating the real inequity, which is on welfare. I mean, let me quote from your book. You said that those born between 1956 and 1961 are forecast to get from the welfare state 118% of what they'll have put into it. When they retire, thanks to your government, they'll get these perks that people of working age are getting stripped back. I accept that there is an issue about how much people put in and take out. And the, but when you look at the overall situation of pensioners today, there's also a role for the welfare state in compensating for loss of income from other sources. And the low interest rates are actually helping younger borrowers and penalising older savers. So we are doing things that are trying to tackle that unfairness, but you're right, there is a fundamental on that. So I mean, yes and no, there is a massive problem with annuities for people who've already started their pensions and aren't getting what they're expecting. I don't agree at all about the main difference being the influx of Chinese and Indian workers. The main thing is this kind of influx of free credit, which has sent the, the cost of houses so out of proportion to wages and, and you know you're, you're, you can only deal with that through government levers you cannot deal with that by complaining about it god knows i've tried um secondly this this idea that you know it's fine it's fine to kind of you know leave the young savers because they're getting a boost because interest rates are so low basically what's happening is not a problem between the generations it's a problem inside the generations between the rich and the poor. Well, and that is going to keep on well, increasing until we face up to it. David Willis, if you accept that there is unfairness on welfare there, do you think, agree, some of your cabinet colleagues have proposed that you get rid of some of these perks, like free bus passes, winter fuel payments, for the better off pensioners? 
Well, the, what we're proposing is actually an even more radical reform of pensions. If you look at our single no, tier No, I'm talking about the pension of perks, you. the free bus passes, winter fuel allowance, get rid of those for the wealthier well, pensions. Look, well, we made a clear promise in the run-up to the last election to keep those, and that promise stands. But incidentally, what this report is about is not 75-year-olds who are having, facing their own struggle on living standards. This is about the plight and pressures of people who are 40 compared with people who are 60. There's a lot, and it's the people who are just retiring now in the kind of tail end of the baby boom who, on average, have done very well. They are the last generation with these defined benefit pensions. And the report rightly identifies the challenge for the 40-year-olds and 30-year-olds by comparison. But, but, but Zoe Williams, you lost your child benefit. You've yeah, got to take that yes. on the chin. But you've <laughs> got a higher life yeah. expectancy. You can buy all these cheaper goods. OK, so wages have stagnated in the last decade or so. But you've got all these cheap, this influx of cheap goods you wouldn't swap your life for the baby boomers would you well look i don't i don't want to live in a country where inequality is the main driving force between uh, of, of social division i mean i don't want to live like that and i would prefer to live the way the baby boomers lived when differences between the rich and the poor were only something like one to four but these two phenomena interact my, the argument in my book is absolutely that one of the problems we face on social mobility and inequality is precisely that if, as a, as a society as a whole, we're not offering a fairer deal to the younger generation, then what you can get from your parents matters more. Yeah. And that just, is yeah, indeed yeah. a challenge. Very, very quickly. That's absolutely exactly. the very challenge. Quickly. Like that. Are the baby boomers just stingy? They don't want to share around <laughs> enough. No, they've had a lot of luck, and it's been reinforced by the voting power of being a big generation. David Williams, Zoe Williams, thank you very much for joining me.